Hey folks, this is Kalani. The Mists of Pandaria Remix event is now available on the PTR for testing, so we can get some hands-on experience with how it all works. There are a lot of moving parts, including new skills and abilities. You can socket into your gear. You can pick and choose what stats you want on some other pieces of gear. There are game-changing meta gems to collect and use, and a new currency that lets you buy all manner of new and old transmog sets, some very rare mounts and toys, and there's also account-wide progression elements that make your characters way more powerful and also help speed up your leveling. So let's go over everything you need to know about this new PvE event coming in patch 10.2.7. Now before we jump in be sure to hit up that like button and subscribe so you never miss another video. Alright, so how do we get started with this new event? It's currently only available on the 1027 PTR for a limited time, but when it goes live with the patch I imagine it will work in very much the same way. To take part in the event, you need to make a new character. You can't use any existing characters, but when you make a new tune, you'll be prompted to make a normal character or a time running character. Pick time running and you can create your character. You can play any race or class available in Dragonflight so that does include demon hunters and evokers. Time running characters start on the Timeless Isle at level 10. This is a quick introduction quest line to show you the ropes, explain a little bit of what's going on, and why we're suddenly working with the Infinite Dragonflight. The introduction section is also where you're going to be given your Cloak of Infinite Potential. This cloak is probably the single most important item in this new game mode. Anytime you loot something, so whether it's mobs that you kill, dungeon bosses, raid bosses or treasure chests, no matter what it is, you're going to have a chance to receive a Thread of Fate. These threads are named after the stat bonus that they're going to grant your cloak, so Threads of Mastery or Threads of Experience Gain, and each time you loot a thread the bonus is added to your cloak and that bonus is permanent. This is my cloak after tinkering around for a bit. You can see that there are bonuses to every stat that you could really want, including a bonus experience buff. So the more that you play and the more that you loot stuff, the more threads you're going to get and the stronger your cloak and therefore your character will become. This progression doesn't seem to have any limit as of yet, so you should be able to just get more and more powerful until the event eventually ends. The cloak progression is also going to help out any alts that you might want to make because it carries over to those new characters. So if you play one character for a while, maybe even getting them up to level 70, the progress you make on that character's cloak will also empower your alt's cloak. So alts start with a huge power and experience boost bonus to make leveling them even faster and easier when compared to your first character. The more you play and the more you power up your cloak, the stronger all of your characters will be and leveling is just going to get faster faster thanks to that bonus experience buff. Now it is worth noting that alts do not have to go through the intro section at all. Once you've done it on one character, other characters you make for the time running mode have an option to skip over the introduction, get your cloak immediately, and then just head straight into the fun. Now after you've done the introduction, you'll start off in the Jade Forest, and from here it's more or less the standard Mists of Pandaria leveling process. The only main difference is when certain content becomes available to play. Valley of the Four Winds and Kressarang Wilds are going to open up at level 20, Kung Lai Summit is 25, Tanlong Steps is level 30, and the Dread Wastes are level 35, the Timeless Isle is then 45, and then the Isle of Thunder is up at level 50. There are some unique event quests along the way, but for the most part you'd just be questing through the usual storylines. Now one huge difference that will significantly speed up your leveling and make questing a lot more fun is that you will have flying unlocked right from the get go. It's not just the standard old flying either, you also have dragon riding unlocked by default. So you can use either flying method to zip from quest hub to quest hub and generally just get around a lot faster and that starts at level 10. Scenarios, dungeons and raids are also unlocked along the leveling journey and this chart gives you a quick overview of which dungeons, scenarios and raids open up as you level up. So you can actually start running dungeons right away, you don't have to quest if you don't want to, you can hop in straight at level 10 and then raids are going to open up at level 25 allowing you to hop in and gain some experience while plundering your way through raid bosses. This does also include LFR so you don't have to worry about setting up groups or joining groups, you can just queue up and experience it that way. 
Killing raid bosses gives you a bunch of bonus experience, and they also do drop a lot of threads, so raids might be one of the better ways to increase the power level of your cloak. Speaking of power levels, characters are insanely strong when you put everything together in this game mode. It's actually kind of bonkers. The bosses that we did on LFR literally just fell over. The entire raid finder wing took just five minutes to clear through, so you can see the powers and effects we have access to really do make a difference. Curiously, Looking for Raid doesn't seem to have a lockout right now on the PTR. I'm not sure if that's just for PTR and testing purposes, but if the no lockout stays in place for when the event does go live, Looking for Raid could actually be one of the best ways to level up and power up during the event. So the content that we're working through in this remix mode is pretty much basically just Mists of Pandaria all over again with dungeons and raids available earlier than usual, but loot in this mode will be entirely different. You won't really see direct loot rewards, especially from quests, instead you're going to see a lot of these cache of infinite treasures. Every quest rewards you with a cache, and they're also rewarded from things like random dungeon queues. Caches will contain some bronze currency, we'll talk more about that in just a moment, they can also contain pieces of gear, as well as some of the new gems, and there are a whole bunch of consumables like bandages, potions, scrolls for buffs, and so on. Now when you do get a piece of gear, that's not really what we're going to be used to either. It doesn't have a lot of stats, but your gear will have special sockets instead. Different pieces have different sockets. There are prismatic sockets, tinker sockets, cogwheel sockets, and a meta socket. The cogwheel socket always seems to be on the boots, and then meta sockets are always on your headpiece. You start with one socket per item, but as you level up, items will start dropping with multiple sockets for prismatic and tinker slots at the very least, letting you equip more and more gems as you progress. Now as for what each kind of gem does, prismatic gems are just simple stat bonuses. They provide whatever stat is listed on the gem when you socket them into a piece of gear. You can also combine these gems together to make them more powerful, so three uncommon combine into a rare gem, three rare gems combine into an epic gem, and then you can go all the way up to legendary gems. Tinker gems are the new skill or ability gems. Now all of these seem to be passive effects, so you don't have to worry about having 10 new buttons on your bar, but that doesn't mean they aren't powerful. There are so many of these new skills available, you can boost your self-sustain and defensive capabilities, deal extra damage in a variety of ways, straight up destroy mobs when they go below 10% health, gain extra stats, turn damage into healing, sacrifice your health to deal damage, deal AoE damage whenever you kill an enemy, deal extra damage with every crit, and you can even build up a big damage store while attacking enemies, and then when they die, they explode for all of that saved up damage. This one in particular seems very powerful right now, especially for clearing through dungeons and raids. There are some really fun combos appearing already, and you can take advantage of these effects to speed through various types of content. Cogwheel gems are a bit different. They seem to provide you with existing utility or mobility spells from other classes and systems, so you can get things like Sprint or Blink on any character, or Stampeding Roar, Vanish, Wild Charge, or Heroic Leap. There are a lot of options for this slot as well that will help fill in some utility gaps for certain classes. And then the big new skills are going to be in the meta gems. These go in your head slot and are active abilities most of the time. They're also a lot more powerful. You can turn into a huge thundering orb that deals constant damage to everything within 30 yards, provide a stacking stat increase for you and your allies, call down lightning storms, or trade your health for a big primary stat increase. There are quite a few options to pick from, just like every other gem, so it's going to be fun experimenting with different skills and setups. Now before you start worrying about needing to re-farm these gems if you want to replace them or change them around and experiment, you start with a special spell that lets you unsocket any of these gems whenever you want. So you just pop them out, pop another one in, and you are ready to go. Now that might seem like quite a bit to keep track of, and it is, especially for newer players coming into this game mode. It's not too bad once you get the hang of it, but you are going to end up with a lot of different gems and abilities in your bags, so you'll need to pick and choose which ones you want to use, and which ones you want to save for later, and which gems you might want to combine for different stat bonuses, and so on. I am curious why they didn't implement the skill gems especially in a similar way to runes in Season of Discovery, where once you've collected the skill once, it's then just a menu when 
when you can apply it to your gear. Maybe it's something to do with the skills being equipable in different Tinker slots and still being unique that poses a problem. Either way, these gems will be taking up quite a bit of your bag space and you'll need to make sure you unsocket them before popping another gem in or before scrapping your gear, otherwise you will need to find that skill gem again. Thankfully, your characters do start with a full set of 36 slot bags, so we do have a lot of bag space to work with, but that's about the only aspect of this event that seems a bit fiddly from what I've seen so far. The other thing you're going to be collecting from almost everywhere is a new currency called Bronze. Everything you kill and loot can drop bronze, and any time you open a cache you will get some bronze. So everything that rewards a cache, like completing quests, dungeons and scenarios, will also yield extra bronze from the cache rewards. The other major source of bronze will be your spare gear. When you start your time running adventures you'll be given a special ability called Unraveling Sands. This summons a little bronze portal that you can interact with and it lets you turn your excess gear into the bronze currency. So whenever you get a piece of gear that isn't an upgrade, or whenever you replace a piece of gear you can pop your extras into this portal and scrap it for more bronze currency. You can also complete daily quests, which ask you to complete scenarios, kill dungeon bosses, or kill raid bosses. They reward you with a bronze cache, as well as a cache of infinite treasure, so you can earn some extra bronze that way. And then there are also bronze orbs floating around in the air of Pandaria. Very much like the Dream Surge coalescence balls you can find in the Dragon Isles, flying through these yields a small amount of bronze, so if you love to dragon ride this could be another option to get some quick bronze. I'm sure we're missing a few sources as well, with the limited testing time we won't be able to explore everything the event has to offer, so I'm sure there are some big sources of bronze hiding out there somewhere. We'll have to seek them out when the event launches for real. So that's how you can get bronze, but what do you spend it on? To start with, it's the currency you need to buy any of the cosmetic rewards you might want from the event, including mounts and transmog. There are special vendors scattered around Pandaria, and you can see them marked on the map as infinite bazaars. There are so many vendors at each of these locations, selling a crazy number of items for you to collect. There's one that sells the new recolors of Mr. Pandaria mounts, as well as very rare mount drops including the Heavenly Onyx Cloud Serpent, the Astral Cloud Serpent, Clutch of Jikun, and the Corcron Juggernaut. So if you're tired of spamming these raids or world bosses in retail trying to get the low drop chance mounts, this event will let you straight up just buy them. This vendor over here sells special toys, some of which are very rare or hard to obtain in the game, and there are even some that are unobtainable like the mini mana bomb. You can't get that in the real game anymore, so this might be the only way to pick that up if you don't already have it. There's a vendor for Raid Finder and normal Raid Set appearances, letting you purchase those from an entire ensemble. You can also get the Heroic and Mythic sets from a different vendor, and one very important note here is that you can purchase and unlock these transmog on any character. It's not class or armor type locked, so you can buy mail and plate sets on a cloth wearer. You won't be able to actually use the transmogs on your cloth character, but you can unlock them for your other characters without having to level up one of each armor class for the event, so that's a nice quality of life detail. There's another vendor for open world content related gear sets and recolors, including questing gear and various unique sets like the Shadow Pan set and Corrupted Shaman set. And then there's also one for dungeon appearances, just to cover pretty much every set and transmog you can get from the Mists of Pandaria expansion. So there are a lot of transmog sets to collect, as well as plenty of mounts, so if you love to collect things, this event will give you plenty of reasons to farm up that new bronze currency. Another vendor that might be of interest to you is this Snacks and Scrolls vendor. They sell the consumables we touched on earlier. It looks like you can buy things to help keep you alive in your adventures, provide any class buff in the game, there are scrolls for lusting and resurrecting, and this very curious item, the Bottle of Bees. You aggro everything within 40 yards and apply a damage increased debuff to them, which can stack the more they are attacked, which could be very useful for AoE farming. You can also spend your bronze to directly buy gems of all types, so you can buy the prismatic stat gems, the spell tinker gems, the movement cogwheel gems, or the meta gems. It is a random gem that you get from this item, so you can't buy the exact one you need, but it does say that you won't get duplicates, so as long as you buy enough of them, you will be able to get one of every single skill gem using this vendor. Having to rely on RNG to fix your bad RNG doesn't really feel great, but it's better than not having the vendor at all. 
bronze is also used to upgrade the item level of your gear. This works in the same way as crests and flight stones, except the only thing you need is bronze. You can upgrade any piece of gear all the way to item level 556, which is very high for this event. That is going to cost a boatload of bronze, but that does mean that if you get a perfect piece of gear up at level 70, you can probably just upgrade it instead of needing to farm dungeons or raids to upgrade it or replace it. With the cost of those higher bronze upgrades and some of the items from the vendors, it's also safe to assume that bronze acquisition is going to speed up significantly at the higher levels. With the currency being used in pretty much every aspect of the event, it's going to be interesting to find the fastest or most efficient ways to farm it. I'm also curious to see whether the harder difficulties of raids at level 70 will be a good source of bronze, because that could create a wide gap in potential bronze earnings. We'll just have to wait and see though. There are also a lot of achievements to work towards and unlock that require completing various chunks of each zone, which all have special rewards like mounts and transmog as well. So there's going to be a lot to keep you busy if you want to unlock everything available in this new game mode. But that's pretty much the entire event in a nutshell. Personally, I think it's going to be quite a lot of fun. Questing through Mists of Pindari again is okay, dragon riding and flying definitely make it more enjoyable, but I think the real fun comes in when you start tinkering with the skill gems. You can set up some really fun and powerful combos that let you stomp through whatever content you'd prefer to do. I don't really think anything is going to be very difficult at max level in this mode. Between the skills, gems, and cloak, even heroic and mythic raids will probably fall over. I will say that leveling does start a little slower than I was expecting. You don't start with any significant XP increase, so you'll need to get some progress on your cloak before you start seeing those crazy fast levels. So your first character through might not be super quick, but alts will definitely see those big power and bonus experience spikes. Now remember that when this event ends, you'll get to keep any and all cosmetics you collect along the way, and you can take your characters over to retail realms to play them in the War Within, so you don't lose any rewards, and these characters don't randomly disappear when everything is done. This should be a really fun alternative to leveling up your alts and getting them ready for the next expansion. But that's everything we know about the Mists of Pandaria Remix event coming in patch 1027, so that's it for this video. What do you think from what you've seen so far? What are you most excited about? Playing through Mists of Pandaria again, having new skills and powerful abilities to play with, or collecting all of those crazy new rewards? Leave all your thoughts in the comment section below. A big thank you to all of our supporters over on Patreon and to all of our members here on YouTube. You can see the names floating by on screen. If you'd like to add your name to the end of every video with a special shout out at the start of the next video, you can find links in the description or to Patreon and click the join button just below this video. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell so you never miss another video. Thanks for watching folks, good luck and have fun, and as always, I'll see you next time.